So welcome everyone to the session about using MATLAB on the clusters. Okay, so why is there a specific session about the use of MATLAB on the cluster? The thing is that MATLAB was designed from the ground up to be interactive, meaning that you have a window, you type in some comments and you get the output directly. And it was designed to be sequential, meaning it's performing one task after another. By contrast, I'm sure you know by now that the clusters, they work in batch, meaning you submit a job and then the job runs somewhere and you don't have access to it and then you get the results afterwards. And the clusters are meant to be parallel. The strength of the clusters is not being able to run a program very fast, but to, to run a parallel program on multiple cluster nodes uh, in parallel. So there's a, a mismatch between MATLAB and the cluster. One more issue is the license. So MATLAB is not a free software. So when you use it, you need to either use a local uh, license or a network license. And the thing is there are multiple types of license, but in a sense, it's a limiting factor because most of the time we will not have enough licenses to run on the cluster. So in this session, I will talk about uh, two things, mostly using MATLAB in batch mode and using MATLAB in parallel. And first, uh, I will explain how to use MATLAB in batch mode when you have MATLAB installed. So for instance, on your laptop or on a computer, uh, you have access to. So the thing to realize is that you might be used to using the graphical user interface of MATLAB. So you have a command window, you have a command history, you have a work workspace. You can set paths by clicking on the menu and add one path or another. And when you have a plot, you can see it directly in your window where you can do, do some stuff. Of course, on a cluster uh, in batch mode, you won't have all this. So we need how to, you will see how to handle that. Second thing is that you are used to maybe open a file with uh, this little icon and then click run. Uh, but when you want to start from the command line, you can do that by using either of these two functions, these two ways. So if you have a script, a MATLAB script, called, for instance, my script, you can feed it through a STDN with this uh, redirection, which you have seen in the Linux session, I'm sure, uh, to the MATLAB command. So you type my MATLAB uh, less than and then your script. And this will start MATLAB and immediately start your script within MATLAB. That's one way to start the uh, script. Another way, if you don't have a script but you have a function, is to use a dash r option of MATLAB. So you write MATLAB dash r and then you can quote the function you want to evaluate. And then it's important to add exit here because actually this instructs MATLAB to start up, run the function, but it does not tell MATLAB to stop. So you need to explicitly uh, put it here. With this way of starting the script, MATLAB will stop as soon as the script is finished. So it's a, a bit uh, a small difference between the two options. Also, you will need to adapt your MATLAB scripts. Uh, on the previous slide, you show the window where you can add the path to get access to additional uh, toolboxes and so on. <coughs> In batch, all this must be in the script itself, using, for instance, add path, where you give the path where your two books are located. Of course, you need to make sure that the path is correct. It's better to use a relative path like this, relative to your script, rather than an absolute path, because if you run MATLAB on Windows on your laptop, an absolute path would look like this. But this, of course, on the cluster, we 
that we are coming to. Also, same idea applies when you load a data set rather than click it in on file open and then find your .max file and open it. You will need to use the load command to open and read the contents. Exactly in the same way, you will need to save explicitly the results. It's very important because most of the time when you work with uh, the graphical user interface, you simply uh, look at the result and then you save what you want afterwards. Here, if you do not put the save command inside your script, you could end up with a job that runs and then it's a lot of computations and saves nothing at the end and you won't be able to access it because the memory will be erased as soon as the job is finished. So it's very important to save the results using the save command. So you simply uh, give the name of the file you want to save, to, you want to create, and the name of the variable or the variables that you want to uh, save in the file. Also, if you have a program that asks questions, for instance, okay, what is this parameter value or how many iterations do you want me to do? You won't be able to do that in batch. So it has to be uh, organized in advance. So typically, if you have a variable A that must take a value and you are used to reading the value from the keyboard by the user, what you will need to do is first save that value in a file and then read the file uh, when the program starts. So let's assume that I have a parameter A and I want it to be 65. So I create a file first in an interactive session, on my tablet, my computer maybe. And then I save parameter A, creates a param file, and then I copy the file to the cluster or to the remote computer. And in the script, rather than having a prompt for the user for the value, I load the param file and then I can use the value A in the, in the script. Okay, so if the script asks multiple questions, you would need to save multiple, uh, one file with multiple variables to make sure that all the variables <coughs> have a value. And then uh, about the figures, you know, MATLAB is very good at creating figures. The thing is, <coughs> uh, on a cluster, you will not be able, or on a remote computer, you might not be able to create a plot and see it, but you will be able to create a plot and print it, print it in a file, actually. So <clears throat> if you have this piece of MATLAB code that uh, simply creates uh, this graph, the plot function will, on a regular computer on your laptop, you open this window, and you will have this. Uh, and afterwards, if you use a print command, <coughs> with here you give the type of file you want to create and then the file name. This print command will take this window and save it to a file. Okay, so the part here will run, but you will not be able to see it. And most of the time, you will have a warning. The output file saying that MATLAB was not able to uh, open the display, but it will not prevent MATLAB from creating the figure. And so it will be able to save it afterwards in the file. Another option is to save the results and then copy all the results to your laptop and use your laptop, your MATLAB instance on the laptop to create the graph that you want. Also, if you are using graphic, um, uh, graphical user interfaces for specific libraries. So this is the uh, IC library, this is Simlink. Uh, you will not be able to click on the same buttons as when you are running it on your laptop. But if you look at the documentation of all these toolboxes, you will see that every button or every functionality as a uh, function related to it, which you can go directly from MATLAB. So if you read the documentation, you will see, okay, I want, uh, usually I do this and click here and click here and click here. If you look at, at the document, you see, okay, the equivalent of clicking here is calling this function with this parameter, and then I call this function. And so you 
should be able to uh, create a script that does exactly what you're doing by clicking. Some toolboxes even have a macro recording option where you click a record button, you click where you want to, to, to click, and then you click stop. And at the end, it produces a MATLAB script that does exactly what you have been doing by clicking. So it's another option. You don't, in those cases, you don't even need to have a look at the documentation. So you will need to adapt your MATLAB scripts if you have already a MATLAB script that works on your laptop. And there's things that I've shown here, you will have to, um, to modify it. And then when it's ready, you need to start it. And here again, you have two options, like I showed earlier, either with the script redirection or with the uh, dash R option. And there are multiple startup options that are interesting when you are working in batch on a remote computer. You can instruct MATLAB to not even attempt starting a display. If you run MATLAB on a remote computer where you do not export a display, uh, MATLAB will tell you a warning saying, okay, I tried to open the display, but I failed. You can say, okay, I don't even want you to even attempt to do that. So it's a gain of time because it's a task, it's a thing that will fail. You know it will fail, so you ask MATLAB to not even try it. Also, no desktop is the same. You know, telling MATLAB do not try to load the graphical user interface with all the buttons. It's a very costly process because the interface is written in Java, is pretty heavy. <clears throat> no GVM. Uh, is um, also interesting. It removes from MATLAB everything that is based on Java. So basically the graphical user interface and all the uh, graphical stuff. So all the computations in MATLAB is uh, written in C and all the wrapping in a way is written in Java. And if you remove the Java vector machine, you speed up the process also. And no splash is just to indicate that you don't want MATLAB to display the logo at start of the issue. Uh, when you start MATLAB on your desktop, you have a splash logo screen with a, a very nice logo. Uh, of course, on the cluster, on a remote computer, if you are, have no display attached, you will not see it. So you can say from the beginning, OK, do not even try. So let's assume now that you have access to a remote computer with MATLAB installed and uh, you can connect with, with SSH that uh, we have seen in other sessions. But the one tool that is very interesting in that session is called a screen. So the idea is that if you connect to a remote computer because it's more powerful, you would do a very maybe lengthy computation and you don't want to be uh, linked, uh, connected, hooked to that computation. You want to be able to disconnect from the computer, leave the computation running, and then connect back again uh, later. But if you connect with SSH and you start MATLAB in the command line and you disconnect from the remote computer, you will lose your uh, MATLAB session. So if you don't want to lose your MATLAB session, you need to use a, a tool called either screen. There's an other alternative called Tmux. Uh, here I will show you with screen, but basically you can do the same with Tmux. So once you have typed screen enter, you will see that the screen blanks and you won't see much of a difference, but there is a difference that you are now in a screen session. So you can work there in your screen session like you would work normally. And for instance, you can change the directory. Uh, here you see that I'm loading some MATLAB module to be able to run MATLAB. And then I run MATLAB with all the comments, the options I showed earlier, and I run a go underscore F function, just an example. And then, okay, 
uh, MATLAB starts. It says that, uh, uh, yeah, you see, I, I did not set no GVM, so I have this warning here saying that the Java options will be ignored because there's no display. So MATLAB starts in the command line rather than having the beautiful desktop, I have a uh, command line. And then I can uh, detach from that session, as we call it. So if I hit Control A, and then I release the keys, and then I type D, I go back to the previous screen. Uh, so uh, this is when uh, I started the screen session. And you see that screen tells me that I am now detached. And so now the thing is I can simply disconnect from the computer. Here I need to go. So I disconnect from the computer, but my MATLAB session is still running on the screen session on the remote computer. And how do I go back there? Simply with SSH. I run SSH again. It can it could be from another computer, it could be from the same computer doesn't matter. And then you can use screen command again with dash R and R stands for reattach. So with this, I will reattach to the screen session. And as soon as I hit enter, I see this exactly the same thing I had in front of me when I hit control A D. Here the difference is that the computation is finished and I have the, the result here. Okay, so you see the problem, you see the solution, and you see how it works. For those of you who attend by Zoom, do not hesitate to ask questions in the chat or so I try to monitor it. So here is an example I will uh, show you, I will use throughout the um, presentation. It's a script that does not think fancy. It just estimates the value of pi using random uh, Monte Carlo approximation. But it has many of the pitfalls I showed earlier, so we will have to modify it to make it work uh, in, uh, in batch mode. So first, it's asking a question. So how many random draws are we using? Then it's using a pi mc function, which is defined in another toolbox. And then there's a printf to show the results. And there's a plot created uh, with the results. And so the plot simply looks like this as a function of the number of iterations is the estimated value required. And you see that it converges to the red line, which is the actual value. Okay, so very simple example, just to uh, have something to play with. Okay, using that example now, I will show you how we can work when MATLAB is not installed. So here, I'll show you how to use MATLAB in batch on the remote computer when MATLAB is installed actually. Uh, and now we will see what you can do when MATLAB is uh, not installed and is the case on the cluster. MATLAB is not installed on the cluster. And the reason is that you see the number of licenses that are available, it's like 120 licenses for all the university here. And you know, we have uh, more, uh, compute nodes, then they are available licenses. So it's not possible to start MATLAB on the first. The first option on the cluster is to compile MATLAB to C. So when you have the MATLAB code, you can use the MATLAB compiler, which is a tool that comes with MATLAB, that will take your MATLAB script and compile it to C. And as soon as it's compiled in C, you will be able to run it on the cluster without the need for MATLAB. So how does it work? Um, it's quite simple. Within a MATLAB environment, you will use the MCC function. 
So MCC stands for MATLAB C compiler dash M, and then the name of the function, the name of the MATLAB function you want to compile. You can also use dash A with a directory to bundle additional resources to the executable. So if your program, if my function uses uh, an external library of an external toolbox, you can also uh, bring the toolbox together with the executable to make sure that everything works uh, with all the dependencies. There is a small gacha in the in the system that the app path function, which I said was needed when you run in batch with MATLAB, uh, cannot be used in the compiled version, and it's not necessary. So if you have a, a script and you want the script to work both interactively on your laptop with a graphical user interface, but also to work on the cluster when it's compiled, you need to protect in a way the app path function with if is deployed. So this is deployed command is uh, this is deployed uh, variable is, is true when the program that is run is a compiled version and it's false is if it's a, a interpreted version. So if not is deployed, deploy it at path, otherwise do, do nothing. So it's just something you need to be aware of at this at the beginning of your, your script if you have uh, additional parts. So an example here, uh, you see I'm connected to a remote computer that has MATLAB installed with the same as just before. I load the MATLAB module and I start MATLAB. Again, I did not export the display, so MATLAB does not start the graphical user interface. I just have the command line, but I'm very happy with that. And then I use MCC. You see the function that I showed earlier um, is, uh, is called the go underscore F. Now I have change D so that it prints the, the figure. It does not ask anything. So I did everything it, it needs to run. And then when I hit enter, it, it gives me a warning about the GCC version. But what I see afterwards when I quit MATLAB in my directory, I have my .m file where my MATLAB function, but also I have this go underscore f, which is an executable that has the same uh, function as this. You also see other things like uh, a readme.txt, a log file, the C version, so this is the C equivalent of this MATLAB function. And you see a run go f dot sh. So the thing is that the C program that is created by the C compiler is not entirely independent from MATLAB. It needs additional libraries to be able to run. And this uh, script uh, is a helper script to start the compiled version and make sure that it finds all the libraries it needs. But here, in this simple example where I have a computer with MATLAB installed, I can just simply run the go underscore f executable and it will do exactly the same. So uh, I have the output here and it does exactly the same as the MATLAB script. And you see here a plot.png, which was not there before I executed the script uh, because it has created a, uh, a figure a file with the contents of the figure that is created. So the idea is that your C code can be compiled to, your, sorry, your MATLAB code can be compiled to C code. And there is an environment to set up for that C code to be able to run. But as soon as it's, it's okay, you can start 
your executable as if it were uh, not a MATLAB script anymore. And so actually you don't need the license to be able to do that. So the compiler gives you a way to avoid the license. And it's not a workaround, it's explicitly um, designed to be so. So MATLAB, the MATWORKS company has decided that the, the MATLAB compiler, if you have the license for the MATLAB compiler, it's all okay for you to compile your encode to C code and use a C code with the, without a MATLAB. There are limitations about what can be compiled. And uh, we will see examples in the documentation. Most of the time, what cannot be compiled is everything that MATLAB does that is evaluating functions. So if in your script, if you have some eval functions rather than calling function directly, uh, that part cannot be compiled because it's an interpretation of the, the language. And so it does not have a direct uh, compiled uh, uh, solution. But most of the time, if you have a simple uh, MATLAB script, it's simple in the sense that it only does computation, it should be able to compile uh, easily. But then again, I said that the executable is not entirely standard low. It still needs libraries to be able to run. And those libraries are called the MATLAB compiler runtime. So it's a set of libraries that are needed for your compiled program to be able to run on a computer when MATLAB is not installed. And so here I will show how to install this, this uh, library. One important thing I forgot to mention is that if you want to run MATLAB, if you want to run a compiled version of your MATLAB script on the Linux machine, you need to compile on the Linux machine. So if you're a Windows laptop, you will not be able to compile on your Windows laptop your program that will run on a Linux uh, cluster. <laughs> When you are running MATLAB, either in the graphical user interface or in the command line node like here, you can use the mcr installer command. And this will give you a path where you will find an executable that you will be able to use to install the runtime component on other computers. Okay, so here, I, I'm assuming that I have access to a Linux machine where MATLAB is installed. And I will want to, comp I, I compile the code and I will want to move it to a computer where MATLAB is not installed. I run this command and I take this file and I copy it to the remote computer. So here what you see, I'm taking the file that was given to me by the MCR installer command. And I copy it to another computer where MATLAB is not installed. Okay. When it's copied there, I will install it. So I run it and it asks me some questions like um, if I'm sure I want to install. And then it's asking me where I want to install the runtime. So I'm giving a uh, directory in my home directory. And then it does its stuff and it installs the uh, component. What I only have to do that once per computer I want to use. Then uh, I can take the compiled version of my MATLAB code from the machine where MATLAB is installed and copy it to the machine where I don't have MATLAB. So here you, you see I copy everything. Uh, I copy the M file, which is not needed, but okay. And uh, most import importantly, I copy the go F file and the run go uh, script, the helper script. And then how it works, simply what you do is you run the helper script and you give it the path where the MCR is installed. So the path where you instructed the installer to install the runtime component. So two slides ago. And you see what the script does is setting up the environment variables. 
So notably the LD library path and so on. And then it runs simply. So you see, we have a computer with MATLAB installed, a Linux machine. We have a computer without MATLAB, also a Linux machine. On the computer with MATLAB, we use the MCR installer command. We get a path to the program that we installed the runtime environment for MATLAB. I copy this file to the remote computer that does not have MATLAB installed. I install the runtime compiler, the compiler runtime. Right? And then I run, I use the helper script created by the compiler to start the executable, and I just give it the path where the compiler runtime is installed. And then it simply runs as if MATLAB was installed, but we don't have MATLAB installed. We don't have a need for a license. What I've shown you about copying the compiler runtime on the remote computer, we have done that for you on the cluster. Okay, so that part of copying the MCR installer and then installing it on the remote cluster is done for uh, on the clusters for a multiple uh, number of versions. And so if you go to Lumen 3 or Nick 5 and you look module spider for MCR, I think now we, we put it in the case or so MCR with uh, capital letters. You will see all <coughs> versions of uh, MATLAB compiler runtime. And you will have to choose the compiler runtime that corresponds to your MATLAB uh, version. And so here you see that I'm on the MANPAC cluster, the MANPAC we have here instead of up. And I just load the MCR. And then I'm able to run directly the program without the need to install for the installer and without the need to use the uh, helper status. Okay, do you have any questions about this, this part? Okay, so that was the first option to deal with the fact that MATLAB is not a free program is use the MATLAB compiler to create an executable that is independent from MATLAB and only needs the MATLAB compiler runtime, which you can install by yourself, or you can use the, the one that are already installed and available as modules on the cluster. That was option one. There's another option, which is to use Octave. And Octave is a program which is designed to be mostly compatible with the MATLAB. Uh, with the big difference that it's uh, open source and free. So Octave works exactly as MATLAB most of the time. So when you start it in a batch, rather than typing MATLAB and then lower them and your script, you use Octave and exactly the same script. You remember that I said earlier that there are two ways to start uh, um, a script directly on MATLAB is with either this symbol or with the dash R. Uh, and there's an equivalent in Octav, but the name is different. You need to just be aware, but the, the functionality is the same. So one thing you can do is develop your script on your laptop with a graphical user interface with everything you like about MATLAB and then run your uh, program on the clusters with Octav. Octav is installed on all the clusters. So you can just load the Octav module and use Octav to run your MATLAB code. Just like with the compiling options, there are some caveats. So not everything will work. And there are some differences which are explained in the Octav documentation. But most of the time, if you are not doing anything fancy and just purely computations, you, it should be very standard state, uh, uh, easy to go from the MATLAB version to the Octave compatible version. So you might have to change some things uh, here and there. But what is certain is that if it works on Octave, it will work on MATLAB. So you might not be able to use all the functionalities of MATLAB, 
but you should be able to uh, have a version that runs exactly the same way on MATLAB and on Octa. So also other caveats is that uh, the plotting functionalities in Octa is uh, is done with the GNU plot, so it's working differently than the plotting with the MATLAB. So it's one more reason to uh, save results and then import the results on your laptop to use MATLAB to create the graphs that you want. Number of toolboxes is uh, lower on OCTAP than on MATLAB. Uh, everything that is Java based on, um, on uh, MATLAB is, uh, is um, a bit less efficient in uh, in Octave, also the multi threading. I will talk about the parallel computing in MATLAB a bit later. But multi threading is a bit better in Octave, as it than, uh, sorry, is better in MATLAB than in Octave. And um, well, some things are not as good, but most of the time it will be sufficient. So here, an example where I uh, start Octave. So you see, rather than having the triple uh, sign about MATLAB instead of that, and I run exactly the same code as before. I didn't change anything. And you see, it gives me exactly the same output and the same type of map. Okay, here, I, I did not run as many uh, iterations as before, so the conversions is not good, but the functionality is exactly the same. So it's really an option if you are used to MATLAB and you work with MATLAB on your day-to-day uh, -day basis. Uh, you can develop your script on your laptop with MATLAB. It can even be a Windows computer, it doesn't matter. But then if you um, <clears throat> make sure that everything works also on Octave, you can simply copy your script and your data to the cluster, load the Octave module and start Octave in the bash script. Um, to, to run your, your program. Okay, so two options, the MATLAB C compiler and up. Do you have any questions about this part? Okay, then I will talk about uh, using MATLAB in parallel, because you remember that I said earlier, one of the big differences between MATLAB and the cluster is that MATLAB was designed originally to be purely sequential. Uh, while the clusters are meant to be parallel. So I will discuss how to use MATLAB in parallel, and you will see that there are basically three options, uh, either with no effort on your part, uh, or with a little effort, or with a lot of effort. And by little effort from your part, I mean that there are some functionalities that are already parallel in the newer versions of MATLAB. So originally, it was purely sequential, but uh, nowadays, <clears throat> uh, some things are um, parallelized with OpenMP. If you remember the OpenMP session, uh, now there are some things that are optimized. So here you see a piece of MATLAB code that basically does a computation of uh, the sign of a random vector, which is pretty large. And you see, I'm using here the maximum conference uh, option uh, command in MATLAB, which gives me the option to specify the number of parallel threads I want to use. And so here I use tick and talk to measure the time it takes to compute the Y vector. And you see that if I'm asking for one CPU, I have this running time. And then as I add more CPUs, the running time decreases. Of course, the uh, speed up is not perfect, but it shows you that it's uh, already possible to work in parallel in MATLAB without doing anything uh, special. But that means that when you submit a MATLAB job to the cluster, so a job with uh, either O or F or um, a compiled version of your script to the cluster, you need to ask for at least four or eight CPUs to make sure that you are able to use the uh, built-in parallel options. 
the things that are already made parallel for you are of two categories. So the element-wise functions and expressions. So everything that uh, includes these functions on a large vector or large matrix will be parallelized automatically without any um, for you, without you having to do anything. <clears throat> and the second part is everything which is related to linear algebra, if you remember. There was a session about optimized libraries with uh, uh, matrix functionalities or linear algebra optimized uh, in libraries. MATLAB uses those optimized libraries. So if the library is able to work in parallel, this part will be parallelized as well. And actually in MATLAB, if you run the version to command and you ask for dash plus, it will give you the uh, reference to the optimized library, which is used for uh, linear algebra and so on. And you see that in this case is the math learning library from Intel. So very, uh, very efficient li uh, library, which is able to use multiple threads on the, mem uh, on the same computer. So there are some functionalities that are already parallelized uh, by default, but you can also, if you have the resources, buy the parallel computing toolbox. And uh, it's kind of a magical toolbox that will provide parallelized uh, versions of the other toolboxes. So if you are using, for instance, the statistical toolbox or the bioinformatic toolbox, and you use in addition to that toolbox, the prior computing toolbox, many of the functions of the bioinformatic toolbox will be uh, in the park and be parallelized. But then it's an additional license which you have to pay for. So these were the two uh, main um, ways MATLAB is already parallelized. Some basic functionalities are already parallelized, and also you get additional parallelized functionalities with the foreign computing toolbox. Now, uh, there are also other options to create parallel programs in MATLAB, but then it will ask a bit more effort. And I uh, will show you an example now. First, uh, most scientific software is organized as a big loop. And if you are fortunate enough that the elements of the loops are independent, which we call them an embarrassingly parallel workload, uh, you will be able to split your loop into independent, independent uh, executions. So assume that I have a big loop with an index that goes from one to 1,000. I can rewrite it like this without loss of generality. I would do exactly the same. So. 1,000 iterations or 10 times 100 iterations is the same. But if I write it like this, then I can, providing the, provided that the iterations are independent, I can remove the auto loop and uh, just use this construct that will allow the SRUM uh, system to make the auto loop for you. Okay, so basically, I will show you the example afterwards. But here, what you need to realize is that um, the i index that goes from one to ten will not be run sequentially, but it will be run in parallel, and the value it takes will be set up in the environment by slow. And this is a way to get this value from from slow. So here. I'm showing you an example. Again, it's the estimation of pi with Monte Carlo. This does not change. This does not change. But here you see that I'm asking slow from my rank. In a way, if you have attended the OpenMP session or the MPI session, it's the same concept. <coughs> then I can run my function here. And uh, the thing is that 
based on the value of i, I will save a file that is suffixed by this number. Okay, so here is the same program as before, except that I modified it to look for a value in the environment and to save the results in a file which depends on the value of i. So at the end, I will have multiple files here that we will have to merge together. So I will need another program like this one, which I called merge script, where I will go from one to 10 or one to the number of uh, different iterations I, I decided. And then I will load and read the result and accumulate all the results to merge them together. So if I have multiple estimations of pi, I can make a better estimation of pi by averaging that. And then here, I create a full plot uh, based on all the results and I save to a file. Okay, so you see the ID here, I had one <coughs> script that does something. I add a piece of a line of code that gets the processor ID or the rank number of slow. And I save a file based on that and uh, on that rank number. And then I have another script that will take all the files and merge them together to get the final solution. And the thing is that the multiple instances based on the rank will run in parallel and you will be able to speed up the operation like this. One issue is that all these uh, require one license per task, uh, but we know what to do. Okay, either we compile it or we uh, use Opta. So <clears throat> here are two examples of slow submission script that will submit the example I just showed. And they all have the same structure. You see here, I'm requesting for two tasks. I'm loading here the MCR module, so the MATLAB compiler runtime. So this is for the compiled version. And this is for the Octa version. And you see here, I'm using SRUN with my program. And SRUN, what it will do, as I explained in the slow session, it will start two instances of this program and one instance will see a slow proc id of zero and the other one will see a slow proc id of one and so after this we will have a rest zero and a rest one created and then i run the merge script and then i, I must give it the number of tasks if you if i go back to the merge script, it needs to know in advance the number of tasks we have used. So that here it knows that uh, it um, must look for two files and merge the results. This merge script must not be run in parallel. It would just accumulate all the results. So I'm not using SRUN in parallel. So for that, it's the same. S run and then the evaluation of the function that does the evaluation and then no S run and evaluation of the script that does the merging of the results. And if we have a look at the output file for such a script, well, it looks like this. You see that I here, uh, here I run it with four rather than two tasks, uh, sorry, five tasks rather than two. So I have five result files. And uh, you see only the uh, end of the file here, but you see the five estimations that have been run in parallel because they were started with s -run. And then you see the last part here, which is the uh, merging of all the files with um, the merge script. And in the end, I have an estimation with 50,000 points based on five estimations when in parallel on 10,000 points. 
Okay, you see the ID. So if you have a big loop, you can, and the iterations in the loop are independent, you can uh, split them in chunks and use SRUN as a replacement for the uh, part of the loop. So if you have access to the part of the info box, uh, again, you will have other options to uh, write programs that run in parallel. Uh, namely, you will have access to a, a bar four, so a parallel four, which uh, basically does uh, automatically what I showed you uh, how to do manually with stuff. So uh, this is a very nice option, but the thing is that the compile, uh, the nice thing is that it can be compiled. So if you have access to the power computing toolbox and you have a part four in your script, most of the time uh, it should be okay. There's another option also with a par F eval, so parallel F evaluation. Uh, so it looks like this, also a function provided by the power computing toolbox. Uh, you give it a number of, you, sorry, you give it a, uh, a parallel proof. So when the file computing tool box, when you start, you must create a proof to actually decide how many CPUs you will use. And then you can uh, use a bar that you get. You give it the handle to a function. You know what the handle is. The function is a reference to a function. And then you give it the arguments. And this will run the magic function on one and ten in parallel. And then actually the way it works is that it works in the background in a way if you attend the uh, introduction to, to the parallel computing. You remember that there are some processes that you can put in the background. And here you have a fetch output function that um, waits for the result to be complete and merges all the uh, evaluations of the magic function on the arguments here. The thing is that compiling of this can, can fail. So if you are relying on this construct, uh, you might be blocked when you try to compile to run all the clusters. So this are the functionalities offered by the product in two box. Uh, but of course, you need to have access to one. If you don't have access to the parallel computing toolbox, you can uh, rely on third party uh, tools. And uh, one of them is called multi core. So it's available on the uh, marketplace. Uh, of uh, MATLAB. Uh, and how it works, it uses the uh, file system as a way to communicate. So on the cluster, you can use multi-core for so the multi-core library to run on multiple uh, nodes. And the way it works is that on the workers, you run this program, the start multi-core state. And on the master, you run a start multicore master. And what it takes is the handle to a function and a set array. And what it will do is apply this function to each element of the set array. So here you see I'm creating a set array named A, where each element is a one uh, square matrix, 100 by 100 elements. Uh, random elements. And so I have 10 of such matrices. And when I start this, MATLAB uh, will uh, dispatch the computation of the eigenvalue extraction of each of those matrices to the slaves. So if I have 10 slaves running that are registered, uh, I will have all 10 evaluations performed in parallel. If I have only five, um, slaves running, then each slave will uh, take care of two uh, matrices and uh, it will take twice the, the same amount of time. 
and uh, the result is a cell array. So uh, just to show a bit more the details. So here with the for loop, I create a cell array with each element being a squared matrix. And the cell res is also a cell array with, uh, with all the uh, item uh, values. So if you are, I want to use this in my example, uh, it's uh, the same as before. You see, I will name the function. It's not important, but I, I need to specify the number of slaves I want to use. I will be using, and I also need to specify a path. That's important. I said earlier that the multi-core library uses the disk file system as a way to synchronize the workers. Uh, and so you actually need to specify in which uh, directory you will write the, uh, well, you will let multi-core write the information. And so what you see here is that in my program, I use the start multi-core master with the handle to my PyMC function, which is the same as before. I did not change it. And then I give it the parameter cell. So this function only requires a number, a simple integer, which is the number of random rows, which I want to use. Uh, so I create first a cell array with as many values of n as there are slips. Okay, so here it's very uh, simple. And then I create also a setting because by default, Multico will uh, pop up a progress bar. So uh, uh, a small window with a red line that goes from zero to 100%. And on the cursor, we want to avoid that because it will fail. And also, I specify here the part where I want Multicore to go write the files it needs to synchronize the work between the master and the slaves. <clears throat> and then when I get the result, it's in a cell array, I need an additional loop to aggregate all the um, results from the, from the evaluation of my function. So in the previous example, I had to write an additional script to merge all the results, uh, but here, as the parallelization is done inside the script, I can merge at the end. Okay, so if I start this and I have multiple workers working on the cluster, it will do the estimation in part. So this was the uh, multi core library. There's an old, other library called PEVAL for parallel evaluation. Uh, that provides two main functions, uh, par cell fun, so parallel cell array function, and par array fun, parallel array function. So the way it works is very similar to multi-core. You specify a cell array in the, in the, in the, in the case of this function of uh, uh, parameters, and then you use parcel fund with here the number of workers you want to use, the handle to the function you want to use, and the set array with uh, the, the parameters of the function. So it works exactly the same as uh, the function IDs offered by the Parallel Computing Toolbox. So here is an example, the same example with the uh, parcel fund. So you see here, I'm using parcel fund. I say, okay, I want four workers. I give it again the handle to my IMC function. And then I give it an array A here, which is simply an array with four times the uh, parameter N. So exactly the same as before, just another way to uh, to work in parallel with MATLAB. 
So this was um, the available part of the cell phone. You have also a ray phone and it works exactly the same, except that this is not supposed to be a cell array, but a multidimensional array. So here I do the same as before. You see the difference is that I'm not having a cell array of 100 by 100 matrices, but I'm having a multidimensional array where the last index here is the index of the workers. And so this will use two workers to estimate this function on uh, 100 by 100 matrices uh, three times. Okay, so multicore also exists in uh, Octav. It works exactly the same as for the MATLAB version with a start of the multicore slaves on the compute nodes and then uh, the start multicore master on the, on the machine that runs the main program. And here again, uh, an example, the same example using the uh, multi core library in Octa. It looks exactly the same as in uh, MATLAB. So, uh, this multi core library is a parallel paradigm that we call SPMD, so uh, NPMD, so different from um, MPI or OpenMP, here we have a master and we have slaves or we have a leader and we have workers. So the way it's submitted in um, a Slurm is a bit different. We will need to use the dash dash multiprog options. If you remember the Slurm session, I introduced uh, this construct. So this file, will contain two lines basically in our case because we have one master as they call it and multiple slaves and you see here that the master will evaluate the uh, go function the, the main uh, function with a certain number of workers and the path where you will want uh, multi-core to write the files that are needed for synchronization between the workers and then you see the tasks one to four will run the multi core slaves simply. And then when you submit this at the end, you have the result. And you see uh, warnings by the uh, multi core libraries that gives you information about the files that it's using for synchronizing. But in the end, when you uh, look at the results, you get the result that you want. One thing that is uh, important to know here is that there is no easy way for the slaves to be shut down. So you have seen that the SRAM will start one master and call slaves. When the master is done, it will stop, but the slaves will not. And actually, what you see here is that the job went to uh, the uh, timeout. So uh, if you are using this in uh, Sloan, you will either have to um, implement yourself a way to stop the slaves when your master has finished, or you will have to monitor the running of the job and cancel your job by hand if uh, you see that your job is finished. Any questions about this? So we saw multiple uh, libraries that will allow you to insert parallelism into your, um, your programs, most of the time under the form of a parallel function evaluation. But then I, I will also mention that I will go into more details, uh, how to use MATLAB in parallel at the lower level, and we will see concepts that are similar to the one uh, explained in the MPI session. Because in Octave and in MATLAB, you can explicitly uh, write parallel programs, uh, but you will need to, to uh, 
to do a lot of work by hand, and MATLAB is not especially good for that. Okay, so the Poly Computing Toolbox uh, offers a SPMD construct where it allows you to create actually a shared memory segment, which is in a sense very similar to an open and parallel section. <clears throat> well, the statements here will be run in parallel. Behind the scenes, it's actually using MPI. So it does a lot of very uh, intelligent stuff to give you the illusion of a shared memory segment while actually the memory is split on multiple computers. So because of this magic, it can be very difficult to get a very nice speed up. Uh, and there are also like uh, third party libraries such as MATLAB MPI that allow you to explicitly write MPI code uh, in MATLAB. So here I will uh, suggest if you are interested to go back to the MPI session and then uh, have a look at the documentation of MATLAB MPI and you will see that <coughs> you, you will be able to write MPI programs in, in MATLAB. Also, the uh, Lincoln Laboratory offers a PMATLAB toolbox that gives additional um, uh, parallel constructs uh, similar in the way to the official file computing toolbox. Another thing that you can do also is, uh, you, I'm sure you know that when you have a piece of code which you want to go fast, in MATLAB you have the option to compile it to write it in C and then compile it and then use it in MATLAB with, as a max file, as you call it. And so when you create a max file, you always have the option to use OpenMP. So if your max file is written in Proton or in C, uh, you can use OpenMP. And in this uh, blog post, there's a very long, very detailed tutorial on how to do that, um, to have a MP, an OpenMP max file that you can use in your MATLAB. Now about uh, Octave, there's also an extension that offers MPI constructs to uh, Octave, but I would have the same um, <clears throat> comment as before. If you're interested, you can go back to the MPI session and then uh, look at the documentation of this package and then you will see how to uh, run this uh, on Octave. Any question about this part? So, just to let you know that you can write MPI code in Octav or in MATLAB if you want, uh, but it will be less, it will be more complicated to make it work than uh, if it's uh, for Tron or C code. So, to summarize, um, when you have a MATLAB script and you want to run it on the cursor, you will have to adapt it. You will have to think about the um, prompts, when you ask the user for some information, you will have to store that information in the file first. You will need to, you will need to make sure that you load and you save corporate data at the beginning and the end of your script automatically. Otherwise, you might lose the computation that you have uh, performed. Uh, don't forget that if you want to print plots, uh, you cannot uh, display them, but you can save them to files. But an alternative is to save the result and then save, uh, copy the result on your laptop and use the MATLAB version of your laptop to create the, the, the graph. And I realize my slide does not appear. Okay. <clears throat> also, I mentioned the screen uh, tool, which is interesting when you run on a remote computer which does not have Slurm installed, and you want to be able to start a MATLAB session there and then disconnect and leave the MATLAB session running. Uh, you can use screen, you can also use Tmux, which is used uh, exactly as a screen, but it has small differences here and there. And then for batch processing without MATLAB, I'll show you two major ways, one with the MATLAB C compiler, where you take your M file and you compile it to a uh, executable in C, 
from MATLAB to C and then from C to the executable. The executable requires a runtime environment, and I show you that you can um, install the runtime environment by yourself on machines where MATLAB is not installed. It is packaged with MATLAB install itself. So if you have MATLAB, you can get it and uh, install it on another computer. We have on the CC cluster installed the MATLAB compiler runtime on all the CC cluster multiple versions. So that should not be an issue on the cluster. Uh, also remember that <clears throat> to run on the Linux machine, you need to compile from a Linux machine. So if all you have is a Windows machine, you need to get access to an interactive computer where you can run MATLAB. So here at UCLUVA, we have a few computers where MATLAB is installed and you can access them with a CASM account. <clears throat> and the other option is to develop with MATLAB and to run on the clusters with the uh, Octa. Most of the time, this should work. The second part was about parallel programming. So uh, remember that some features of MATLAB and Octa are already programmed in parallel. So it's important when you submit a job to the cluster to at least request four or eight CPUs. Otherwise, you're, you are not benefiting from this uh, implicit parallelism. Uh, there are libraries such as multi-core or parcel evolve that can help you write parallel software. They all work as a uh, master slave parallel. And then I just mentioned for the record that you can use MPI also in the MATLAB uh, with a proper process. 